want to, to, to segue into that because what we're going to look at today, the person that we're going to look at today, she didn't live in the perfect setting. She didn't live where everything was going wrong. In fact, it was a little bit like that scene. The house was a mess. Things were chaotic. Things are not how they have been. Uh, the husband, she's not getting any help. But yet she has to rise up and, and do it herself. So I'm going to call uh, Caleb up, and he's going to read for us. We're going to be in Judges chapter 5 today. So if you can turn there in your Bibles, click there in your Bibles. Please follow along with Caleb as we read Judges chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. Then say... Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day. The leaders took the lead in Israel, that the people offered themselves willingly. willingly. Bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. To the Lord I will sing. I will make melody, melody to the Lord, God of Israel. Lord, when you set out from Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom, the earth trembled, and the heavens dropped. Yes, the clouds dropped water. The mountains quaked before the Lord, even Sina before the Lord, the God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned, and travelers were kept to the byways. The villagers ceased in Israel. They ceased to be until I arose. I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. When new gods were chosen, their war was in the gates. Was shield or spear to be seen among 40,000 in Israel? My heart goes out to the commanders of Israel who offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless the Lord. Amen. Let's pray for God's word this morning. Dear Father God, thank you for your word. God, thank you for speaking to us, guiding us to give us direction. God, thank you for victories. And thank you for carrying us in the times where everything's to be, everything seems to be shaken. God, thank you for your power and your love in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to open this morning, and we're going to look at what is called the mother of Israel, Deborah. And, and before we look too much at, at, at Judges chapter 5, the song, the poem that she sings in, in victory, I want us to look at, okay, who is Deborah? Who is this person? Why is she called the mother of Israel? Well, if you turn back to Judges chapter 4, we see kind of this cycle of what's happening with the people of Israel, the children of Israel. In Judges chapter 4, 1 through 3, we see that the people had been doing their own thing. It says the people again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and, and they started doing things how they wanted to do it. And as a result, they were conquered. They were taken captive. And then it says, then they cried out to the Lord for 20 years. So here comes Deborah. Here, here's the scene that we see Deborah coming in. It's kind of like that scene in, in Mom's Night Out. Deborah doesn't come on the scene where everything's organized. Things, systems are not put in place. Her house is not kept in order. Rather, she is operating in a very chaotic time. They have gone away from God, and as a result, they've been taken over. Her life is not what she wanted it to be right now. No one hopes that they are taken over, that they are captives. No one aspires to be a slave or a servant to a country. But that's where her life was at. And if we continue on in Judges chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, we see her leadership. And again, Moms, I want to speak to this because sometimes God uses you guys, and very few times does God make everything nice and calm and easy and then call you to lead. Oftentimes, it's in the heart of the storm. It's in the midst of trials. It's in the depth of pain that God calls us to rise up. In Judges chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, we see just the impact of Deborah's leadership. We see that, that uh, she was a prophetess and that she judged Israel. And she used to sit under a palm tree and she judged between Ramah and Bethel. And, and I bring these places up because it's not like Deborah just like 
was like a mom to like a whole bunch, like she wasn't like the neighborhood mom. No, her, her leadership was very large. And, and if you continue to read, it says people would come to her, they would seek her judgment. And I can't think of a better illustration of what a mom does. When I come home, Adrian usually says, the kids have been fighting all day. I just don't want any more verbiage. Just quiet. And here's Deborah sitting under this tree, and, and people would come with their problems. Some of them were probably legitimate, but moms, you know the thing. So-and-so took this from me. So-and-so looked at me funny. So-and-so hurt my feelings. They're breathing my air. <laughs> she sat there. She listened and she judged wisely. She gave reason, and I think another big part that I see moms doing, she listened. She gave attention to these people. Now, the job of, of a prophet, of a prophetess, it was that they were able to walk with God so closely that God would speak to them and that they would be able to share God's word with the people. That they would be able to speak God's truth to the people. And especially during this time, remember, her house is not clean, her house is not perfect, rather she's living in chaos. She's able to hear them and give reason in the midst of chaos. She's able to give God's truth in the midst of the time where people didn't want to hear it. But yet, for some reason, they kept coming back to her and seeking her judgment. And, mamas, I, and moms, I think that's so important, and dads too, is that when we speak God's truth, it's not always received happily or joyfully. But when we speak God's truth, people tend to come back. They may not like it. They may leave in a huff. But when it's God's truth, people listen. And here's Deborah. She's, she's ruling and she's leading. <clears throat> See, God created her. He called her up. And he commanded her to be who she was. Moms, I want you to hear this, that God created you. Hopefully you know this, that God, he created you. He formed you. He knit you together in your mother's womb. And he's called you up. He's called you to be the mom, the grandma, the aunt, the the niece, the best friend, the sister. He's called you that. He's called you to be a place of influence one way or the other. And as he's done that, he's commanded you not to just go through life and see what happens, but rather he says, speak my truth. Lead others in the way that they should go. And now we get to the really fun part, and this is why I chose this. Because this is the time that all moms, all women love to hear. And it's three little words. You were right. <laughs> you love hearing them because you hardly ever hear them. Uh, <laughs> and, and here is Deborah. She's judging, and, and again, God called her to, to an unlikely role, an unrealistic position, and just an outright ridiculous purpose. Now, she led, she ruled in, in a time where it was very male-dominant, where for, for a woman to lead was almost unheard of, both for the Israelites and, and all the surrounding nations. But because she was walking with God, God said, you're unlikely, you're probably not looked on very well, but I'm going to use you. I'm going to use you greatly. Moms, I know... Sometimes you feel like, is anyone even listening to me? You know, like the 10th time you've said something and it's still not done. You're like, is, is, does anyone listen to me? Am, am I speaking English? I know Adrian says that. She's like, what's the point of me even saying anything? Like, it's not, it's falling on deaf ears. But God called her up and he uses her. And he calls her to a purpose that is, is so unlikely. See, the Canaanites, they came and defeated them. And this isn't just like a close battle. Like, they absolutely destroyed them. And she's going to allude to that in chapter 5. But we get to the heart of the matter is God calls up Deborah. And it's very unlikely. But then she challenges the person who would have actually made the most sense for God to lead. This guy named Barak. And he was the military leader. 
Now, in, in all reasoning, he would have been the most sense to be the judge, the, the person to lead Israel. But why he, from what we read, still did what he wanted to do and was afraid of the call that God had placed on him. See, in, in Judges chapter 4, 6 through 10, we see the account of Deborah calling him. She calls him out. And this isn't, you know, the, the part of being a prophetess is sometimes you speak truth, and sometimes that's the first truth, especially in a nation not following God. But in this account, this isn't new to Barak. She calls him out, and, and she, it says she summons him. She has to say, hey, I need to talk to this guy. Moms, how many times have you said, go get your brother? I need to talk to him right now. She summons him, and she calls him out. She says, has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, go and gather men? She calls him out. She says, God has spoke to you already. And I know you've heard it, but you have not done it. Moms, how many times have you said, hey, go do something or do this? And the response is, I know, I know. But you're like, well, if you know, well, why aren't you doing it? Here's Deborah, and she says, Brock, God's called you to raise an army up and to throw off the bondage that these Canaanites have put on us. Why aren't you doing it? And his response is like, well, I'll go do it. But why? Only if you, Deborah, come with me. I love this. For two reasons. He acknowledges the spiritual leadership that she has. And during this time, we also see that Deborah stepped up because there was no male spiritual leadership. She says, I am not willing to let God go unnoticed and unfollowed. I'm going to step up and lead. And Barak notices that. And he asks a woman who would have had no military training, he says, I'm not going to go into battle unless you come with me. Again, that makes no sense, except for the fact that he knew she was walking with God. He could sense that, Mom, sometimes kids are going to walk away and push, but we got to stay strong. Because eventually they'll come around and they'll ask for I think sometimes guys can be the strongest when moms are there. Why? Because when they get hurt, well, yeah, when they get hurt, not if they get hurt. When they get hurt, they know they can go back to mommy. And she'll kiss it and put a Band-Aid on it and make it all better. So they can be tougher as long as mom's there. But when mom's not there, maybe they're not as, as tough. They might make worse choices when mom's not there. But here we see her calling up Barak. And she says, fine, I'll go with you. I'll go with you, Barak. But know that the victory that the Lord is going to give our nation is not going to go to you. Rather, it's going to go to a woman. Barak, because you have not listened to God, because you've not obeyed God, because you do not have the faith that it takes to step up and step out, that is not going to be rewarded. It's going to go to someone who's willing to do the hard thing that God asks. So we see the battle go, and, and I, I love how this battle is actually won. You know, we think, you know, okay, Deborah's probably going to get, you know, the last swing at it, but it's actually this, this completely other woman, and I'm not going to go into it because it's like, mm -hmm, PG-13 plus. Um, so if you want to know more, continue reading Judges chapter 4. All I can say is it's super intense. If you know how it happened, that was a funny play on words. If not, read it. Um, yeah, yeah, intense. So here we come down to chapter five. They've won the battle. They are free. And, and we have to realize, you know, after, they have been oppressed. They have held, been held captive for so long that in the midst of this, Deborah stops and she writes this poem. She sings this poem. She sings this song. And this wasn't rehearsed. We see that it, it comes right after this, that she didn't, take a t she didn't go away, write in her journal, and then come back and say, hey, guys, I have this song. Listen to it. This poem, th this chapter 5, this wells up from an attitude of grace and of glory and love for God. 
that just came out of her, that she recognizes how great and how good God is, and she exclaims this. Now, um, Caleb already read for us uh, chapter 5, 1 through 9, and that was from the ESV, and I'm going to read uh, from the message, paraphrase. It, it gives a little bit, um, just kind of the melody that it goes. It says, The day that Deborah and Barak, son of Abnon, sang the song, when they let down their hair in Israel, they let it down and blow in the wind. The people volunteered with abandon, bless God. Hear, O kings, listen, O princes, to God, yes, to God, I'll sing, I'll make music to God, to the God of Israel. God, when you left Seir and marched across the fields of Edom, the earth quaked. Yes, the skies poured rain. Oh, the clouds made rivers, the mountains leapt before God, and Sinai, O oh God, before God, the God of Israel. In the time of Shemur, the son of Anath, in the time of Jael, public roads, they were abandoned. Travelers, they went by back roads. Warriors became fat and sloppy. No fight was left in them. Then I, Deborah, rose up, and I got up a mother in Israel. God chose new leaders who fought at the gates, and not a shield or spear has been seen among the 40 companies of Israel. Lift your hearts high, O Israel, with abandon, volunteering yourselves with the people. Bless God. I read this and I love this song. At first, it starts off, Deborah makes kind of two parallels, a, a contradiction. She stops and she says, look at what has happened when we followed God. And then later in, in verses 6 through 8, she says, look at where you were. Look at what God did when you followed him compared to where you were when you were doing things on your own. I think of this as um, right now we're in the shoe tying stage. And, and moms, I'm sure you guys can think of a lot more of examples like this. But I think this always and only happens when you're in a hurry. And you're like, all right, let's get your shoes on. Let's go. And you, and you go, and someone has their shoes tied, and you're like, all right, let me help you. And they're like, let me do it. You're like, okay, let me, let me, I can just, let, we got a quick, let me do it. You're like, okay. So you watch your kids struggle, and you're just like, come on, we got to go. And you watch them, and like, they've only got like the knot tying part down, so it's like a knot, and then another knot, and then another knot, and you're just like, no, this is going to be so bad. And you're like, can I help you? You're like, no, let me do it myself, mom. Until what? Until finally, you either hit your breaking point because you've had one of those days, or they say, okay, mom, help me out. And at that point, you have like this shoestring of like 17 knots that you're just like, oh, you got to untie them before you can start really tying the shoe. I think Deborah's trying to get them to realize how the Israelites' behavior was. See, they were in this cycle of God had provided to, for them. And then they said, you know what? Maybe we could do something better or something else is here. And then they would start to go off. And they'd start doing things their own way to the point where they were pushing God away and to the point where they were rejecting God, to the point where then they were trying to do things on their own without God. And then that led to being conquered. And all the time, I, I, just, I just see God as... Sometimes when you're watching your kids struggle, hey, let me help you. No, no, no. No, I, I, let me just help you. I can do it. No. Okay, I'm, I'm here if you need me. I can do it myself. Watching as, as the situation goes from bad to worse the entire time, knowing if you would just let me help you, I could fix this. This would be done already. Let me do it myself, Mom. Until finally, until it's just completely messed up. Then they say, help me. I'm like, thank you. Man, and so much greater. This, is, this is, has to be how God felt with the people of Israel. Just seeing them go away from them, make an absolute mess of something good that he's created, but yet they think it's not good enough or we can do it better ourselves. Deborah says, remember where that got you. And I want to pause because so, so many times if, if we read through the book of Judges, sometimes it's maddening because it's this cycle that keeps going over and over and over again. This book, they, they follow God 
and then they do things their own way, and then they get captured, and then it takes them years to finally realize, hey, let's call out to God, and it just happens over and over again, and you want to say, guys, learn the first time, but they don't, but I don't want to just point fingers at them because, at least for me, I, I see that habit over and over in my life too. God has given me good things, but yet there are parts of my life where I can say, okay, God, I'll give you Sunday, and I'll give you these parts, but God, I got this over here. I don't, I don't need you over here. I got this. Or, okay, God, you've given me this, but, you know, I don't know if you considered this. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off after this. Sometimes in our own life we have this cycle, and that is why it's called amazing grace. Because it's not just one time that God gives us grace. It is over and over and over again that he welcomes us back, that he gives us mercy, that he gives us grace for the times we've walked away from him. So in, in her contrast, she says, look at the victory God has given us. And it is important that she stops them and says, guys, don't miss this blessing that God's given us. Sometimes when good things happen, it's so challenging and so frustrating that we give that glory, that blessing to anything else. And sometimes we miss the fact that that's God's gift to us. She says, this is what God has given to us. Don't miss this. And then she puts in contrast where they were. Look with me in verses 6, 7, and 8. These, these are the points. She's describing how bad life was to them. It, it says, she talks about the highways were abandoned. They took the back roads. Okay, the people of Israel, it was so bad that they were afraid to take the main route. Why? Because they were afraid of their captors robbing them. That they wouldn't go on the highways and, and they would have to sneak around the backways. They were not safe to travel. They, and again, that affected then their trade. Trade dwindled. In verses 7, it says, Villagers ceased in Israel. They ceased until I arose. Verse 8, it said, and excuse me, uh, verse 8 says, Then when the gods were chosen, their war was in the gates. Was a shield or a spear to be seen among the thousands in Israel? So their just bullheadedness had now cost them travel, which caused economic downfall which caused their military to dwindle. I, I find it funny in the message paraphrase that it says, you know, the warriors were fat and sloppy. There was no fight left in them. When you don't have weapons, when you don't have training, you're not ready for war. And in fact, the, the people ruling over them, they didn't want them to have an army. They didn't want them to have a fight left in them. Their walls were obliterated. Obliver that's a hard word. Were destroyed, <laughs> and they were reduced to almost nothing. Do you see what Deborah's doing? She says, "Guys, the victory God gave us was not anything we could do. We couldn't even travel to get, to trade. We, our warriors, didn't have the, even enough spears or shields for everyone." This wasn't something that we're like, hey, we got a 50-50 chance going into this. This was like a we have a no chance going into this. And she says, guys, this is only through God that we are victorious. Follow down with me in, in verse 9 as she concludes. She says, my heart goes out to the commanders of Israel who have offered themselves willingly among the, pe among the people. Bless the Lord. Moms, you always look ahead to the next life stage your kids are in, right? Especially like with your first kid. You know, you have them like, oh, I can't wait till they sleep through the night. Oh, I can't wait till they can sit up on their own. Oh, I can't wait till they crawl. Oh, I can't wait till they walk. I can't wait till they talk. And then you're like, I can't wait till they be quiet. I can't wait till they learn how to sit still. <laughs> and we're always looking ahead to the next stage, to the next good thing. And this is Deborah's prayer. This is her looking ahead 
with just encouragement and longing. When she says, man, I have seen these people go off and do their own thing. And I don't, I'm, I'm ready for them to get out of those years and to do what? And to go and where they offer themselves willingly to God. She says, I'm ready for them to get themselves out of the stage where it's, I can do it, I can do it, mine, 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 and say, God, here I am, use me. And she looks ahead longingly, like any good mother says. She's like, I, I pray that you will mature into a usable vessel of God. And she seeks that, and that's how she continues to lead. And it's really interesting, as you look at the account of Deborah, compared to all the rest of the judges, so many of the other ones, once they've won that battle, once they've liberated Israel, so often you see a very quick backslide. But we don't see that with Deborah's account. We see her leading faithfully in God. Why? Because I think she saw, she understood this phase that we were in, we can't go back to that. No one, I don't think anyone among us was like, you know what? Junior high time was the best time. I'm, I wish I could go back to junior high time right now. Can we get a show of hands to like, I wish I was 12 again. Okay, oh, Titus, that's because you're not 12. <laughs> but there's a certain idea where you're like, you know, junior high was not super fun. There was everything changing. I don't want to go back to that. Deborah says, people of Israel, children of God. Don't go back to this time where you were struggling, where you were opposed to God. Don't go back to that time. Rather, walk ahead. Seek after God. Grow in maturity. Grow in spiritual maturity. And she encourages them to do that. So moms, I have, I have two things I want to leave you with, and then uh, Joe's going to come and read a, a psalm over you guys. Moms, I want to remind you that God, again, has created you, has called you up, and has commanded you to be the best leader that you can be. And that's not always going to look nice and pretty. It's not going to be easy all the time. I just, again, that, that mom's night out, that scene where she's like, the house is a mess. I'm just wanting to hide from the mess. One, another uh, scene in this movie that, that really encapsulates, man, the mess that we create, but how God turns it to beauty is, is the mom was, again, having another one of those mom days. How many moms have, like, this love-hate relationship with markers and crayons in their house? Where it's like, it's great when you draw on paper. Not so great when we draw on the walls. We, she sees one of her daughters just coloring on the walls, and she just looks she's like, oh, no. So when she finally musters enough strength up, she starts cleaning, and you see her start to paint over all of these drawings that the girl did. And then she stopped, and then she looked at them. And she sees this graffiti <coughs> that her daughter put on the wall, and she does something so cool. She goes and gets picture frames, and she hangs them on the wall and turns this mess, this destruction of property into what? Into something beautiful. Into these amazing pictures that her daughter drew for her. Moms, that's what God is doing in your lives. He's taking the mess that we are in, the pain, the hard times, and he's not going to leave us there. Rather, he is going to turn it into something beautiful. And we might look at it and say, oh, how is this going to happen? How, how am I going to get this off the walls? And God says, let me handle it. I'm taking your mess, your pain, and I'm turning it into something beautiful. And second point is, moms, I don't want you to miss the blessings that God gives you from day to day. And I know that's so much easier said than done. It's so much easier to, to say, oh, aren't my children just little angels after you've had one of those days? And you're like, hmm, grandma and grandpa, you want the kids for like a year? But Deborah stops the people. When, when the natural inclination with them to be go and raid the camp, get all the gold they want, she says, stop. I don't want you guys to take another step until you realize the blessing that God just gave you. 
the blessing, the joy that God gave you. And from that, from her realization of that, this poem, this song wells out of her, and she's able to give all glory and honor and praise to God. So moms, don't miss the littlest blessings that God has given you, just like Elijah in the, in, in the cave Sometimes we wish our kids would just come home and say, Mom, you're the best mom in the world, and all my friends' moms are nothing compared to you because you're number one. That would be great. But usually it's like, uh, Mom, Timmy's mom lets him have an iPad. I don't have an iPad. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> good for Timmy's mom. <laughs> That's where we're at right now. But sometimes it's the little things. It's the hugs. It's the kisses. It's the little snuggles. Don't miss those moms. Don't miss those because those are God's blessings in your life. Uh, I'm going to have Joe just read a, a psalm over you moms as, as a way of, of, of prayer and of encouragement to you. And then we'll sing one last song uh, called Tremble. And, and this song kind of came to me as, as Deborah's song talked about the mountains trembling as God passed before them. And this song talks about, man, even when things are chaotic, it's God that silences the storm, calms the trembling, and makes the darkness go away. So Joe is going to read for that, read from Psalm 16 for us as the worship team comes up. Psalm 16, uh, 7 through 11. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You, may, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fulfillment of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. God, I just let this song awaken in us the times that are hard that we think we have to do things on our own, but God, let us give them to you. Just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with us as we sing Tremble.